Hello and welcome to Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And it's the big one. <laughs> the big best one. film ever. Oh, come on. <laughs> I've finally seen Casablanca. Yes. So I've never, never seen it before. So we've just seen Casablanca, uh, me for the umpteenth time, Mike for the first time. So I'm very, I'm very yeah. curious so to I've get seen, all your thoughts on it. I've seen bits and pieces of it before, but never all the way through. And I never really knew what happened because I thought, I will watch it one day. Uh -huh. So even though there's that very famous ending, a, a beautiful friendship, and he's looking at you, kid, I, I, I had a sense of how things fit together, but never really knew. So um, it was a pleasure to, to actually see it. Uh -huh. And... Um, you know, for all the for all the all the kind of pressure, I guess there is of like this is the famously the greatest screenplay of all time. Mm. Everyone says, and and, and one do of people the really say that? People do say that. Okay, That's okay. definitely a thing. That surprises um, me. And um, I mean, it's one of those screenplays that kind of in in screenplay books and things kind of is is held up as the absolute perfect. Oh really? Um, yeah, it really mm. is. Um, uh, and the film itself is obviously an absolute classic, and people adore it. And you kind of think, oh, God, you know, so. Films from the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, like you, sometimes they, they're said to be great and you just don't get on with them. Who knows mm. how it's going to go? And I really loved it. Okay, great. Oh, it's really good. So It's so romantic. Oh, I think that's what people don't expect, that it is music, so romantic. It is. The, it's so romantic and the music is just luscious and it just underscores everything so beautifully. Actually, what I think is really, really nice about it, really interesting in a way, is um, Rick is... I think one of the reasons that people might say it's one of the greatest screenplays is because um, it's so witty. Everyone has something witty to say at some point. Um, there are some characters who are funny than others, but like people kind of... Lines always have a couple of meanings or there's something ironic to them, mm. um, and particularly Rick's. And I think what's interesting about his character is that um, he he's actually completely sincere, but he kind of operates through... Irony, mm. you know, and he's and it's because he's defending himself from mm. from his heartbreak. Where and like these days, if you if you tried to tell a, a similar sort of story, I think it would just be ironic. Mm. You, do you know what I mean? Like, so it's not he's not fully open and sincere about anything. Mm. He's he's actually he's he's covering himself up and closing himself down. But the, but the way that he does that tells you everything about him. Mm. And actually, he's kind of the character. Is not emotionally open, but the actor is. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Oh, that's that's good. Um, you do you know? Did you know that like they operated without a screenplay, right? The screenplay was never finished, and the actors actually didn't know what was happening or who would end up with whom. Right. right? No, not really. No. Yeah. So it was one of those like, you know, seat of the pants. Uh, yeah. There were you know pages written overnight, and you know, yeah. un un it started with an unfinished screenplay. Right, so so. Well, so. I was just reading a, a blog um, that includes a quote from Paul Henry, uh, talking about uh, taking on the role mm. of um, Victor Laszlo, and it, and it's, it does say in there that like part of he didn't want to do it originally because the screenplay was uh, he thought it was not very good, and then part of convincing him to do it was him ending up with Ilsa at the end. Yes. So clearly there is some. You know, level of changes, whatever. Ah, well, um, I, you know, I, I remember reading Ingrid Bergman's autobiography where she said, you know, until the last minute, she didn't know, you yeah. know, and it was very difficult to act. And maybe actually that's, that was good because actually she couldn't act knowing who she was going to end up with. So, yeah, you know, so maybe yeah. that worked to its advantage. Um, do you think that it's a great screenplay or do you just think that it has great lines? It's not the same thing. Um, I, I agree it's not the same thing. And actually, I do think it's a great screenplay and, the, and because I was paying attention to that. I was trying to think about it. I mean, I'm not like a great expert on screenplays or anything like that at all. But you do kind of pay attention to the way the, the, the story is, is, is written, I guess, and, um, and the way characters are used and their kind of arcs and things. And um, it's, it occurs to me that... Um, for one thing, the world of, of Casablanca feels unbelievably real, and it's mm. down to the, the huge variety of characters who are in it. Mm. Um, they're all kind of popping in and out of the bar, and you've got the, you've got the police guy, and you've got the Nazis who are there, and you've got the guy across the road who runs the other bar who wants to buy it, and you've got Sam. And, um, and they all interact in, in bits and pieces, and some of them more than others, but they all every character 
you, you feel like you understand them basically even those who are uh, fairly thin such as the guy who runs the other bar I forget his name Sidney Greenstreet right um, well his character is pretty thinly drawn yes nonetheless you, you just get him well that's because the actors are so great well there's a bit yeah. of that but, but I think it is in there no, and then the, and, go on I don't think it's just a little bit of it. I mean, this has some of the greatest Hollywood <laughs> bit players of all time. And actually, not just bit players, stars in their own right. Like, you know, Sidney Greenstreet and Peter Lorre, you know, they would go on to, to star in films. And they had done so in the past. Obviously, Peter Lorre was M, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of French actors. The, uh, um, I forget what his name is, who was in La Règle de Jeu, who's in this. You know, there's the Russian actor who's in all those Lubitsch films. There's S.Z. Zakal, who's the waiter, who's like one of the delights of, you know, classic Hollywood film to see him. Yeah, he does like fantastic double takes, right? He's the one who's yeah. in the scene with what watch? My watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, I Claude do think... Claude Rains. And Claude Rains. Who I love. Who's fantastic, right? And again, who is a, a star in his own right, really. Uh, and Conrad Veidt, who plays the Nazi, yeah. right? So, I mean, it is one of the great supporting casts of all time, you know, and they do give flesh, I think, uh, um, you know, to the characters, which is actually what star, even character actors are meant to do, mm. right? Yeah. You know, so I think if they get some witty lines, which they do in this film, you know, and then the actor brings in his persona... You know, that's enough to help con help construct a world and a character and a set of attitudes. And, yeah. You know, so I think that's that's brilliant about the film. Um, but all, but going back to the to whether it's a screenplay that's good or whether it's just a few lines, I think it's also that um, the the development of the love triangle and particularly the what you learn about Rick mm. and and kind of the, the timing. Of, of when you learn things mm. and like he's at his lowest moment she comes back and he gets drunk and that then it goes into the extended flashback of what their relationship was and how it ended mm. it kind of it's it's just it's beautifully put together and beautifully timed so you just you, you get right at exactly the right moment you know sort of all this this incredible heartbreak that's made him what he is and then she walks in yes you know I mean and actually, you can't write that except you did well actually I, I think I think my critique you know, wrote that with light, really. And, mm. you know, because, I mean, I noticed this time, you know, she opens the door and there's a b burst of light behind her. Yeah. You know, and she's, I mean, it's just beautifully staged, really. It's kind of like magic, you know. I mean, just the same way that afterwards at the end they go off into the fog. Well, they, you know, they could have just gone off onto the plane or, no, yeah. they go into the fog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I need to point out that we watched this on her media. You've got it on Blu-ray. And we just watched it on, so you know, watched it on a nice big telly with a, a nice sort of, you know, sound system, or whatever. But it's not, it's not the cinema. No, but it's not the cinema. It's not the cinema. Nonetheless, I mean, it was great. And I, I, I mean, how to put it? Like, on the one hand, I don't feel like I, I, I missed. Like, I feel like I just, I, I was sucked into it. On the other hand, imagine how even greater. It oh, was I can tell you, like, you know, exactly. I'm so glad you liked it. You know, and I was very, I really wanted to, to see how you would respond to your first viewing of it. Uh, but I felt very much, because, you know, a lot of the pleasures of this film are, I was going to say tactile, though obviously that's ridiculous. But, you know, to watch Ingrid Bergman's face, mm. half encased in shadows, with the pin spots in her eyes, you know, on a screen that's like 40 foot tall or something, yeah, you know, yeah, on yeah. a really good print... Like, you know, to just feel like kind of it's almost like you're in her face or in her mind. I mean, it's a very powerful thing to see this no, movie. No one is shot that way anymore. No one's no. lit and shot that way anymore. And those beautiful close-ups that she gets. Yes. No one gets that anymore. And um, Celia, uh, who we had on the First Reform podcast, ah. has been telling me for ages to watch Casablanca because it's one of her favorite films. So she, she thinks I'd really like it. And you know as well as I do how you know, she's just in love with yeah. uh, sort of 40s films and... and um, she says it's. She says that like that was that was when kind of uh, cinema was at its most romantic, and I think she's kind of right because you don't. No one is shot like this anymore, and no one you don't you don't get that that beautiful kind of that just incredible openness. There is something. I mean, I love forty cinema also because of the way people speak. You know, because there's there's almost like um, a hushedness to the way of speaking. Yeah. You know, which which 
when which, people express their love for each other, it's like they're doing it in a secret. Yeah, you know, they speak softly, so you expect to hear it like in a big cinema and be surrounded by sound and by image. And also, it, it does give it the quality of a dream, you mm -hmm. know, somehow, right? It's, it, yeah, it's yeah. like kind of otherworldly voices, you know. And of course, in this film, I mean, it's some of the great voices in the history of cinema. I mean, you know, not just Ingrid Bergman and Bogart, but also Paul Henry's voice. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and not to speak of, you know, Conrad Veidt or Peter Lorre or Sidney Greenstreet. They really have like, you, you know, mm. you hear them and you instantly recognize who they are. Uh, so, you know, to hear them speak in this way, I think it, it does create a mood and, and I thought it was very powerful. And, and I think the setting contributes to that as well. The idea of this kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in French occupied Morocco. Yeah. And so they're away from the war, but they're no they're nowhere near safety. It's this kind of purgatory that they're living in, and you kind of there's this talk of getting visas and doing favors for people that maybe you'll get you'll get a, a, an exit visa, but you're essentially trapped there um, until you know the war that's happening somewhere else yes. might eventually stop. This kind of so it's this it's just this dreamlike space that everyone's stuck in, yes. moving around in and just constantly bumping into each other because there's nowhere else to go. It's very dreamlike, and it's also actually oddly contemporary. Like, you know, kind of watching this, you mm. could imagine now, like, you know, refugees from, I don't know, yeah. Yemen or whatever, like having similar kinds of experiences, trying to figure out how to get to a safe space, you know, through mm. visas. I mean, you know, the sense of like people trafficking and so on. I mean, that's in a way what the film is about. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, you know, uh, what people have to do in order to kind of get away from from danger zones. So, of course, you know, this is, I suppose, the well to do in the casinos of the world. This is like the dream adventure version, you know, but it, it nonetheless has resonances of things, you know, that kind of. Well, it's also about, I mean, I was thinking about it in terms of. Um, like neutrality and complicity, yes. and that sort of thing, because that's I think a huge element of the story, particularly a huge element of the of of, of Rick's um, character arc. Really, yes. is in is in re-engaging with the fight. Yes, you know, because he was. People talk about you ran guns to Ethiopia, you fought on the good side yes. in Spain, yes. and now you don't anymore. And he's and he spends a lot of the film saying, "Why would I do a favor for anybody? Why would I stick my neck out?" Yeah, you know, and right at the start when Peter Lorre is arrested, he just stands in front of him and lets him go. Yeah, that's what everyone's used to. And then his his story is about re-engaging with the fight and becoming involved again until at the end he actually kills a Nazi. Yeah, you know that's pretty hardcore. I mean, uh, and and the Marseille scene is where it. I think it turns around. It still gets to me, you know. Like I don't know. I, I must be like a Pavlov dog or something, <laughs> you know, because. Kind of every time that that every time that I I watch that scene and no matter how many times I've watched it, I still get all emotional. I can understand it. It's and actually one oh. thing. It's such a powerful piece of music. Yes. You know that's one of the things. I mean, it's a brilliant. Like imagine if it was like the Top Cat theme or something, it wouldn't be the same. <laughs> it's yes. an incredible piece of music, and and that's one of the reasons it's so arousing. But also, it's it's the it's the setup of you know the Germans are singing mm. one thing and then it's overtaken by the other and the Germans mm. have to sit down amazing yeah. and <laughs> it is, it is. through song you know, <laughs> it's like the battle of the band it is like, that, that's and you know it's like as time goes, as time goes by that's like again it's like the music kind of kind of means so much and and makes things happen um and um I like I, 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 I think it's interesting in the Marseille scene it's 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 the nod from from Rick that's when he kind of turns, yes. Because the band looks at him before they before they agree to play it. They look at yes. him because it's like we're not sure well, if we can. <laughs> that's him. That's that's the beginning. That's his declaration of whose side he's on. Yeah, you know, like exactly. Uh, you know, so that is uh, an important turning point. Um, and the moment that he, you know, and then and then they play the song, and then that's like okay, the bar's got to get shut down mm -hmm. now. You know, so, so like complicity, neutrality has kept him safe and kept his business open yes. for all this time and, and now he takes a stand in it and he can't survive yes. he's offended the Germans so the film has like some of the most memorable lines and endlessly quotable lines uh, in the history of cinema uh, that's that's for sure it has a great supporting cast it does or at least I find it moving 
Um, it is, as you mentioned, it's very, very romantic. Um, what else did you... I picked up on the character of Yvonne. Ah, yes. Played by Madeleine Lebeau. Oh, right, okay. Who I just looked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, who I, I find... She's not in it very much, but I think she... she her character says an awful lot. So basically, she, she, she comes in... She's French. Yes. And uh, the first time you see her is very early on in the film when you're establishing really who Rick is. Um, and they've had this one-night stand, clearly, that... Um, uh, that and he's just, he's just, I don't think, I don't remember about it. Well, so he has some witty line about, mm. you know, last night was you know, already too long ago. Yes. And tonight I don't make plans that far ahead. Yeah. Um, so we kind of sarcastically, but, uh, you know, uh, rebuffs her. But, but clearly it meant a lot to her. Yes. Which kind of, which actually kind of, um, kind of foretells in a way, like what you're going to learn about, um, about Rick being left at the train station. Mm. You know, it's like it meant so much to him and, Yes, he's uh, like and just, closed just kind off of, his heart. Exactly. Uh -huh. And he got that letter that just said no. It's, mm. like, it's like five lines of a letter that just go, no, it's not happening. Yeah. So, so, you know, and, and you know exactly like how that would kill you. Mm. Um, but that's what happens to her f from him. Uh, and then she starts going out with a German, right? She, well, she comes in well, with a German. You're forgetting the Russian barman who says, Yvonne, I love you, oh, I yes. love you, I love you. And actually, there is something going on there, right? But, you know, or I get the feeling that there is. Um, but then she does go, you know, pack off with a German. So obviously, like, she's on the make. Yeah, she comes into the bar with the, with the German and, uh, and orders an expensive round of drinks for herself, basically. Mm. And, um, and you kind of get the feeling that, like, she, she is sold out, uh, I suppose is one way of putting it, like, you know, and, and is and is enjoying the, the sort of riches mm. um, that come with colluding, mm. in a way. Um, collaborating. Collaborating. Is the word. Sorry, yeah. Um, uh, and then I think the only, the final time you see her, I think, is in the Marseillaise scene. Yes. Where, and I think it's interesting that she gets close-ups in that scene. Yes. Um, where everyone else is just the, the shots of the crowd singing. Yes. And, he, and a shot of the Nazis kind of mm. responding and sitting down, but she gets close-ups. And again, there's those beautifully lit <laughs> sort of close-ups. And she's crying her eyes out, singing it. She shouts, Vive la France. Mm. And, um, and it's like, that's, that's her kind of re rediscovering her patriotic pride or, you know, do you know what I mean? Her some... conscience, I would say. Okay, actually. yeah. You know, because I think one of the things that I really love about the film it's how unjudgmental it is, right? People do what they need to do to survive, really, mm. yeah? And actually, the film has, you know, it's, it treats them all very endearingly, right? Um, kind of, it accepts their foibles, right? Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, it also kind of, I don't know if it draws a line, or, or, but just because it accepts all these people's weaknesses and difficulties and the things that they have to do to get by, you know, doesn't mean that there are no ethics or that there's no morality. Mm. Yeah. And I think actually that's a moment where the film also kind of makes a stand, you know. So she might have slept with whoever she needed to get, you know, to sleep with to get by and, you know, and the last one may have been a German or something. But actually this is a moment where, like in French, they say a prise de conscience, where she she acts on her conscience, you yeah? know, like... Yeah, well, the, the film gives her the opportunity to... Or the film... Make right. Yeah, so so it's both the character's thing, but it's also the film taking a stance on it, obviously, as well. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that it supports that character. Yeah. yeah. And it's in sympathy with her. And I just think, like, in those kind of three or four scenes of, uh, in which she's involved, the, it's, like, it's like the whole film in Microcosm. Yes. Certainly Rick's story in Microcosm. Yes. You know, and I think it's really elegant. That is. Um, and really moving as well. When she cries, it's yes. really, it's really moving. Well, it gets, that, that scene always gets to me. Yeah. Um, I've been watching a lot of Michael Curtiz's films, you know, and visually, he's just extraordinary. And this is a further example of that, right? There are all these little things that I've picked up on. So, for example, you know, when he, when he goes, when he's having that, um, that conversation with Louis, the... Uh, um, Claude Rains character. The Claude Rains character. Renault. Renault. And, you know, he goes to get the money in the safe. And basically what you see is Bogart's shadow talking to, to, yeah. to Claude Rains. I mean, you know, and that's just a way, it's like using a mirror or something. It's a way of creating off-screen space, right? Mm -hmm. The other one is when you're at the Blue Parrot, 
And actually, in order for the filmmaker to tell you that you're at the Blue Parrot, again, he's using the shadow of the sign outside, but bringing it inside. Yes. And then, you know, you begin with a close-up of that, and then you move into the, the Blue Parrot itself. Mm. I mean, really kind of skilled, yeah. elegant. I mean, it's very yeah. light. It's not that big, no big deals made of it. But they're part of what adds to the texture of the film, you know. Yeah, which like it, you could very easily establish that scene by just by having a shot of the sign, yes. and then you cut, cut and you're inside. inside. Yeah. But the, but just the the thought that's yes. gone into showing the shadow and then you're and staying in the same shot as it moves up, yeah, is elegant it is. and thoughtful and yeah. Yes, I I loved uh, uh, all those little things, and I think, you know, the other thing that um, is worth mentioning, I suppose is Dooley Wilson, right? Because, you know, in a way, it's kind of a very difficult character to play, right? You know, he he is, um, you know, the black musician in the film. And actually, in films of this period, that could have been licensed to treat him very badly, mm. right? You know, whereas actually the film is incredibly, I think, A, respectful of the character, yes? Mm. Um, I mean, you know... It's, obviously still Bogart making a deal for him, right? Like, you know, at the end when he gets 25% of the profits, yeah? Mm. Um, you know, so it's still kind of mediated through, you know, a kind of a white patriarch, I suppose. But nonetheless, you know, within the, 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 the terms of the time, you know, it's somebody who's, like, allowed their dignity and then has this marvellous quality to his voice, I think, actually. Mm. You know, it kind of... As soon as he begins to sing, it just kind of creates a, a, a mood just through tone, you know, not particularly through arrangement or anything. Just the tone of his voice is kind of very conducive to what the film is trying to convey. Yeah, I think what you say about about him being shown kind of respect by the film is a really good point. I'm thinking particularly of um, the the scene where uh, Rick has uh, met Ilsa again for the first time, and then it's that night and he's getting drunk on his own and and. He tells Sam to go home, but he won't because he needs to look after Rick. Um, and he's ba and he's basically he's in a kind of petulant sort of, mm. sort of tantrum almost. Mm. Um, and he's kind of yelling at Sam and saying, you know, if she can stand it, I can stand it. Play the damn song. Mm. And um, and he is telling him what to do, and he is his boss. But still, it's like there is there's a certain degree of friendship almost or maybe not quite friendship but you know they've they come together from paris and yes you know, i would say friendship yeah. i mean yeah. and so like they you know there's a relationship between them yeah. um that, that i think you know so even though ultimately sam does have to do what he's told because he, he gets paid by by rick um it, it's it's a uh, it's not an uneven not entirely uneven relationship between them it feels like there's some nuance in there so. i mean he's the one actually sam who like when when ilsa comes to the bar and she doesn't see Rick there she sees Sam you know yeah. he's the one who kind of helps them like not, not exactly established contact but but he's the sort of he's the he's the kind of key well, <laughs> to he's, start. yeah well he's the conduit through which you become aware of the problems yeah, yeah. Uh, involved that there's feelings involved um, and actually that's the point that I wanted to bring up because I think the other thing that this film is remarkable and that you don't see very much. Um, and actually, now, uh, even less, is, you know, is men suffering for love, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's true, isn't it, right? Like, the whole beginning of the film, and particularly when she comes in, you know, Bogart just evokes this sense of, of hurt, mm. right? Of having loved, of being in pain, right? Because... You know, he feels he was left, yeah. right? I mean, those are normally... That's normally the terrain of, like, you know, a woman's melodrama, right? Like, you yeah. know, somebody who's downtrodden has been made to suffer because, you know, because a man was no good or he left or... You know, and actually, this is, in a way, the roles here are reversed, right? It's like, it, yeah. it does begin with Bogart, you know, doing the suffering, right? Yeah. You know, It's a men's melodrama. I think it is. Yeah. I can't think of a film. I mean, I think a lot of film noirs, actually, in a way, later do do that. Mm. But it's still very difficult to think about one which is so central. It really is just a man... Most of the film, it's a man suffering for love and having to put on a mask and keeping cynical and cool and distant 
as a way of kind of not showing what's inside, which only the Dooley Wilson character knows. I was, I was going to suggest Venom, but... Yes. <laughs> maybe, maybe the only place it will be compared to Casablanca. Okay. Let me um, ask you, a, well, a last thing for me, because, you know, part of the criticism is that this is one of the most entertaining films of all time. Uh, but actually that it's not a great film, you know, that it has no depth, that it is all about good lines and kind of cynical attitudes or attitudes that they're not real people. They're just kind of attitudes to a situation and actually that they're not true or real. Yeah. No. Or have depth. Well, of course I'm not. asking. No, I mean, <laughs> who says that? That's just people trying to be contrary because... They say, well, everyone says this is the best film of all time. I'll sound interesting and say it's not. That's is, all it is. is. That what, <laughs> I, I actually do feel that, so I'm asking... No, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I, I don't think there's a weakness in it. I, I, you know, I really thought, like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's so hyped and it's, it's so sort of in top ten of everybody's list sort of thing and, um, that you think you're going to come to this and just go, oh, God, why didn't I like it? Hmm. You know, but that's not the case at all. I don't think there's a weakness in it at all. Um, you know, I, I don't think that that you can't criticize it for having like not having having. What do you say, people who aren't real? Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, sure, like, <laughs> sure things are, high, and it's 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 operating in in you know kind of heightened melodrama at points where you know um, those extended scenes of of. of um, Bogart and Bergman expressing their love to each other and, and, and the music swelling in the background. That's exactly what you want. And yes. I don't... You know, if, if you find it kind of fake or whatever, that's only because... That's only because you don't see it anymore. Hmm. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um... I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's a formative film in the sense that, you know, when I was a teenager, a very young teenager, actually, like, I mean, literally the first time I could go to films on my own, mm. there used to be, you know, quite a lot of repertory cinemas in Montreal. And actually during this period, you know, this was a standard, standard programming. Like, you know, yeah. you'd have Casablanca showing, you know, once a month or whatever, and to have and have not, and, you know, the, yeah, Woody Allen films would be part of it, and... Bergman and yeah there, there was a repertoire and cult films and you know but actually this was kind of like part of the repertoire of yeah. uh, um, uh, that repertory cinemas would show uh, and it was always packed and it would always get an incredible reaction and actually you know the size of the screen and the venue and seeing it with people because one of the things about this film is that it works so well and as soon as the, the audience starts responding is like it kind of creates a hum or, you know, there's a collective conversation that happens with the film. Mm. You know, it's like it, it, yeah. it does. It's one, it's one of those things, really. You know, so it's, it's, it's one of those films that I saw over and over and over and over again, really. You know, it's the kind of film that people kind of memorize, really. Um, do, you have a, uh, do you have a shirt to students? I'm doing so for the first time this year. Oh, you never done it before. I've never done it before, so that's kind of you know I was so interested in your in your response. What, un, under what sort of rubric are you? I'm showing? showing it as a series of Warner Brothers films directed by Michael Curtiz. Okay. You know, so we're going to be talking about you know Michael Curtiz and genre and you know Warner Brothers Studios in the classic period and classical cinema. Right. You know, so um, that's also a way of introducing people to, you know, these stars, right? Like Henry and Ingrid Bergman and Bogart, um, which you're often surprised, but actually a lot of students, you know, have never seen a Bogart film. I'd never seen a Bogart film. This is my first one. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Yes, I think, I think, I don't, I don't think I've seen another one. Yes. Um, so anyway, so, the, you know, and also to introduce them to all these fantastic character actors, because... You know, uh, as we said, Sidney Greenstreet, Peter Lorre, Esed Zakal, 
Uh, Claude Rains, the great Claude Rains. Claude Rains. Well, Claude Rains, I consider almost more a yeah. star, you know, because, <laughs> I mean, he was he was the Invisible Man and the Saskatchewan. You know, he, yeah. he had a lot of leading roles. He's slumming it in this. Um, well, he always played like let's say, you know, the first name under the title, <laughs> or yeah, in exceptional yeah. cases, he'd get over the title. So he was like a star character actor, let's say, uh, you know, and actually, just. A delight, you know? yeah. Like, um, so, so, so it's a way of kind of just bringing that into everybody, and I do think that what those actors bring is just brilliant. I mean, you know, when um, when when that uh, guy, the, the 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 wallet picker, the pocket. Oh yeah, the pickpocket. The pickpocket. Uh, you know, when he bumps into Ez Ed Zakal, the waiter. Yeah. yeah? I mean, just the double takes that he does whilst he's checking his thing is a yeah. thing of beauty to, to watch, you know, because it's like a little, a set of little chuckles and a laugh just based on business, yeah, of, of yeah, yeah. you know, no, no dialogue. I mean, it, it takes great actors to do well, there's that. A wonderful, of, there's a wonderful emphasis on gesture throughout the film. Yes. Your physical acting is, is enormously important to like, you know, um, so it may be the greatest screenplay of all time, but that doesn't have anything to say about how people act. Yes. And and there's an awful lot of of of, of you know, things done in kind of knocking the glasses over and um and as you say the kind of the business around uh, around the pickpocket and just little movements that people have. You know, when Rick, Sydney Grin Street it, swatting the, with the fly yeah. swat well, you know, he does that three times for emphasis, you know. The the Rick nodding, you know, becomes a huge deal. It's it's it, it signifies huge changes in his character. Mm. And um and that bit where, in the same way, he he remembers, and then um, uh, he he tells Sam to play as time goes by. He tries to stick it out, and the camera moves in on him, and he kind of goes ugh, and he just, and he just moves a little yeah. bit, and it just you feel every all the pain inside him just ugh, <laughs> and then he goes into the flashback, you know, it's, and that's all physicality, and that's all just just gesture and physical acting. Yeah. And it's beautiful, and it's really it's. I think that's, that's I think that's what you might mean by tactile. Hmm. That's yeah. You know, there's an element of that in there. Okay, good. And so you know you can shove it up your ass when you say I never watched, <laughs> I never watched black and white films. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we should do this as a regular feature of like you know classics. Um, yeah, films that I should have seen by now. <laughs> well, it's lovely to 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 see you engage with them. So yes, and besides, I'm sure. Our thousands of fans would like to know our views on films that they're likely to see. Well, there's there's um there's definitely a sector of our audience that will listen to this podcast and none of the others. Yes, <laughs> yes, and respond to it really. So so, so I think we should. I hope of, I haven't let them down. How are you? <laughs> we need to make this a regular feature. <laughs> so I'll draw up a list of films that I haven't seen yet that make me ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, we we could ask, we could we could we could ask, uh, you know, whoever listens to us, mm. uh, you know, if there's any of those classic films that they like that like us to cover. Actually, yeah, yeah. So Email you know, we the canon. Yes, kind of, you know, offer suggestions if if you want, kind of, to eavesdrop on Mike uh, <laughs> uh, and I talking about a classic film. Uh, offer us a list of of which ones you'd like us to discuss. Yeah, because they're, they're available. They are, Important. you know, and and one of the great joys of of watching film is actually seeing, you know, what is available, uh, and you know, kind of, uh, it's a it's a joy uh, to watch and to discuss them. Yeah. So, so um, if you want to email us, um, the email address is eavesdropping at the movies at gmail dot com. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter as well uh, at eavesdrop movies. Um, uh, you can listen to the podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. And our blog is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>